Last weekend, we had one of the craziest northern lights or aurora borealis storms that we will probably ever see in our lifetime. KP9, or in other words, the highest level of aurora, rained down all across the world in places where you would never expect to see the aurora, such as Africa, India, Hawaii, even the United States and Mexico border. I was fortunate enough to be in Yellowstone National Park at the time where I was able to capture a few shots that I am really happy with. Due to that event, I know there's a lot of you guys out there with many Aurora images that are just waiting to be edited. I thought it might be helpful to push out a video this week covering how to edit your Northern Lights images in Lightroom. I'm going to work you through a few tips, tricks, and techniques that I personally use when editing my own Aurora photos, which is hopefully going to help you to edit your own images. And of course, if you're new here, I'm Austin James Jackson, a professional landscape photographer from Southern Utah. Now, my recommendation is that you should follow along with this video alongside your own edit. So if you have a second screen, an iPad and a phone, uh, pull up this video there while you edit your images on your main computer. Let's go ahead and jump right into Lightroom. Okay, so I've got my raw image here and just like with any other edit, the first thing that I like to do is scroll down to the profile corrections here. I like to enable them and then re remove chromatic aberration. I check those two boxes on almost every photo. Now you should have something that it'll you'll notice when you check this, it should remove the vignetting on the side. So that looks pretty good. Let's go ahead and scroll back up to the top now and we will begin to work on our photo. First thing that I recommend doing, if your photo is like underexposed or it's overexposed, uh, bring the exposure down to where it's somewhat properly exposed. You can see my histogram here. It's okay to have all this on the left side. That's the foreground. But the sky, I want to be right about in the midground um, or in the middle of the histogram rather, uh, which looks pretty good to me. Once it's, if it's not there, like I said, adjust the exposure to get it somewhere in the middle. Maybe we could leave ours like that. Next thing that I like to do uh, with an image like this is go down to the tone curve. I just want to add a little bit of contrast in there just to start it out. I like to create an S curve, which is going to help me to add contrast. It's going to make the sky punch a little bit. I always like to click and hold this eyeball here to do before and after, before. And after. Now I also like to go down and grab this very far left side point. I like to bring that up. I don't want to do too much because it gives the photo kind of a matte look, but I want to bring it up just enough so that the blacks aren't totally crushed. Somewhere about in there looks good. You can click and zoom in down here on your image, but I think that's looking pretty good to me. You can see we've gotten rid of some contrast in the foreground, which is good. I don't really want the foreground to be super contrasty, so that looks pretty good to me. Now we're done with the tone curve, we can close that down. Um, don't be afraid to go back to it later if you make a mistake and you want to make some adjustments. But let's go ahead and work with some of the other sliders here. First thing I notice is my foreground is still pretty dark. I just want to bring the shadows up. I don't want to do it too far. You notice a lot of people will make the mistake of bringing it up too far in a photo like this because they want to expose the detail in the foreground. Honestly, the most exciting part about your shot is the sky. It's not the foreground detail. So I don't want to bring a lot of attention to the foreground details, but I don't want it to be totally pitch black either. I just want it to kind of hold the spot in the photo, but not really scream at you. Somewhere about in there looks pretty good. Now you can adjust the highlights. You can go one of two ways with this. You can drop them, which might give you some more kind of bands, some more pillars in the sky, depending on how strong the conditions are, or you can raise them. This is going to help make them pop a little bit. My recommendation is to actually reduce them slightly and then punch the whites, bring those whites up. And that is going to bring a little bit of punch into your image, just like that, like in the way that's looking. Now you can also adjust the black slider a little bit, might actually bring the black slider down and bring the shadows up a little bit more, somewhere about in there. Let's toggle what all these basic sliders have done before, after, before, and after. Now we can go down and adjust the presence sliders. I always recommend with any slider, you move it around to see what it does and see how it's affecting your image. On a photo like this, I actually like to remove texture and remove a little bit of clarity. It's gonna help to kind of make my sky have a little bit more glow, which is really important. I want some glow in that sky. Now we can go in and adjust the vibrance and saturation if we want it. Honestly, it's already pretty uh, vibrant and pretty saturated, but we can of course slide some sliders and see what it does. For my personal taste, I'm going to leave it just about right there. Now, a lot of you guys, if you're shooting on auto white balance, which I did, you will find that your camera didn't do a very good job adjusting the white balance. So we need to figure that out. 
because it's really important that your white balance is correct. And it's really hard to dial in because obviously we've got greens, we've got uh, magentas. Um, so we have all different sorts of colors. Really, my photo I think looks pretty good when it comes to white balance. But if yours is off, one thing you want to make sure if I had you know, an image like this where there's just too much uh, magenta, there's magenta where there should be blues, you would want to bring that down. And then same thing, if there's green, like you're getting kind of a muddy color up here, you would want to bring that down. So you can adjust these um, to wherever you see fit. I might make some very minor adjustments here to how everything looks, but you can see there's a lot of play here um, with what you want to do to make these, to make this image look how you want it, I guess. Out in there looks good to me. I didn't change it too much, I don't think, but um, it's always worth sliding and kind of playing around with those sliders. But I think that's looking pretty good. Let's go ahead and move on now. We're gonna just kind of work our way down here. We're gonna use the color mixer next. Now the color mixer can get out of hand pretty quickly on a photo like this. So you wanna be really careful to not overdo the adjustments. You very seldom are gonna to wanna to be plus 100 on anything when it comes to the color mixer. Let me show you guys exactly what I mean. So we're in here. Um, the first thing that you might be tempted to do is adjust the saturation of the individual colors to make them pop a little bit more. Um, I would honestly recommend starting with the luminance. I like to use the luminance to kind of either darken or brighten my colors. This can kind of help things to pop. Um, or, and if you bring the luminance up, they're generally gonna get a little less saturated, but a little bit brighter. Bring the luminance down, they're gonna be more saturated um, and not quite as bright. Now, one thing that you need to make sure, you'll notice when I slide this too far, is especially with these magenta, purple, red tones, when you slide this slider too far, um, you can see how it gives us this like weird, ugly banding because of the selection that it's making of the colors. Same thing when I slide the purples, same thing when I slide the blues, you don't get it as much with the greens, but you do get it with some of the other colors. So do be aware of that. You can still bring this up just a little bit, but you don't want to do it too far. And I'm actually not going to bring this up on my photo at all, but I did want to show you that is an option. I might bring the greens up just a touch, and then I'm going to add some saturation to kind of counteract that becoming brighter. You can see now this is the change that was made. I think that's looking pretty good. You might want to be careful down here with stuff like this, but just be aware when you're making these adjustments. I might also want to, yeah, you can see as I adjust this, it, it kind of gets ugly around the edges. It's really difficult to use these sliders for night photos where a lot of the colors blend together. So for that reason, I'm just gonna leave those as is, but that is an option down here. You can also use the point color if you want it, if you know how to use that. Uh, I won't talk about that here, but that is an option as well if you know how to use it. If you don't and you wanna learn how to use it, I will link a video here where you can check that out as well. Now we'll keep going down. I'm not gonna do anything when it comes to color grading, um, but I will work in the detail slider just a little bit. What we wanna do with the detail is just add a little bit of sharpening. So I'll hold the Alt and Option key here, and then I will uh, click and drag on the masking. And the Alt Option is one key. It's like the Option key or the Alt key, depending on if you're on Mac or PC. You'll drag that. Now, essentially, anything that's white is going to be sharpened. Anything that's black will not be sharpened. Anything that's gray will be partially sharpened. Now, my subject is this tree, so I want there to be a nice white edge around the tree. That will sharpen the tree. I'm going to leave it like that. I want to zoom in when I'm doing this. Command plus on a Mac, control plus on a PC. I want to bring the detail all the way up, the radius all the way down. And then I can adjust the amount of sharpening. Now you'll notice when I zoom in, I'll zoom in so it's really easy for you to see even if you're watching this in a lower resolution. Step back once. This is with no sharpening applied and as I continue to bring the slider up, you can see it's applying sharpening. I don't want to apply so much that it gives us this like noise on the edge. I just want to sharpen it as much as possible without adding that noise on the edge. Probably about right there is good, before and after, before and after. That's making a pretty good selection. Now we're going to come back here and use this noise reduction a little bit later. We're going to do that last, so we'll skip over that for now. We'll scroll down. There's nothing else here that we want to use at the moment, so I'm going to scroll all the way back up. So now we want to use the masking tools. If you guys haven't used them before, I'm going to briefly show you how. If you have used them before, this will hopefully not be too slow and boring for you, but I'm just going to give you a really base level understanding of how to use those masking tools and how they can help you to uh, make your Aurora images look a lot better. 
So when you come in here, hopefully this selection will work good. You can go ahead and click to add a new mask. You can just select sky. Now that should instantly select your sky. Um, anything that's white will be adjusted. Anything that's black will not be adjusted. Anything that's in between black and white will be partially adjusted. So you can see this does a great selection of our sky here. What I want to do here is scroll down and I want to create an S curve again. I want to create some contrast in the sky just like that. Now, don't go overboard here, folks. Um, this is a really easy adjustment that you can overdo and it's going to look terrible if you go overboard on it. I'm going to do that same S curve we used before. I'm going to drag up that blacks point just a little bit. And I might drag the highlights to the left. That'll give a punch. And when I say drag the highlights to the left, that's this very top right point. I'm going to drag that. Uh, if you drag it down, it will pop the highlights. If you drag it left, it will start to pop the highlights when it adjusts the middle of the curve. It's really hard to explain. Don't worry if that didn't make sense to you. Um, just know that you should test both of them and see which one you like best. But now you can see before and after. So I punched those really, really nicely in there. Now I can go in and maybe adjust the highlights a touch more up here with the slider. Just like that. I think is looking pretty good. You could adjust the exposure if you wanted to brighten or darken it. You could bring up the saturation if you wanted to adjust the saturation. Again, we're just affecting the sky here because we're working under this mask number one. We can toggle that before and after. So you can see we've added a nice amount of contrast here. One thing you can do if you really want to spend a lot of time editing, I personally won't do it with mine, but in your Aurora images, one thing you can do to make them look nice is create a new mask and use the brush and what you're going to do is go in here and you can i would just recommend maybe exposure bringing that up bring it up like about to one or so and then go ahead and bring the density of your brush down to like 10. once you've done that i like to adjust the size of my brush to be nice and small and then you can just go in here and start to paint. And you can see if it comes on a little bit strong, you can drop the exposure. But essentially what you're doing here is you can really help to accentuate these streaks in the sky. Now you want to be going straight up and down. One thing you'll notice if you start to paint and I'll increase the density so you can see it a little better. If you start to go in like an unstraight line, uh, like a squiggly line, that's not good because it's not going to look realistic. So if you want to go straight, click on the image, hold shift, and then click on the image again, it'll draw a straight line. Obviously, the density is far too much on that one, so we'll drop the density a little bit. But then I can just go in here, click, hold shift, click again. And I can do this over and over again, following the same track. And that is going to help you to kind of accentuate many of the pillars that you have in your image. And you can do this all day if you wanted. I am aware this is adding a little bit of a creative touch because um, you're adding to the image by painting or you're trying to give the look that you're adding. But I wanted to show you because I know some people will be interested in doing that before and after, before and after. I would spend probably a lot more time doing this. You can also bring up the saturation, um, which will help to bring it up in some of those spots where you've painted. But you can really go to town with the brush doing as much or as little as you like. So that's another great option. Now the last thing that I like to do here is add a little vignette. Yes, I'm aware you can add a vignette um, in the some of the effects sliders back in the basic tab here. I want to show you guys how I add a little bit of custom vignette because I think it'll be really nice on an image like this. What I want to do is create a new mask. I want that mask to be a radial gradient. I'm going to drag that radial gradient out like that. And then you can bring it over into the center of the image just like that. Now, the problem is what we're doing right now is we are selecting the center of the image. We want to invert that so we are just selecting the edges because that's what a vignette is. It, it selects the edges. Click on the three dots here. You're going to go down and click invert that mask. And now you can see just like that. Now, I like to bring the feather down a little bit. Usually around 50 or 60 is probably good. 
Um, but you can play with it after you do this next step, which is to adjust the exposure. You're just going to bring the exposure down. What that's going to do is just darken the edges of the photo, which are is very important. In my opinion, it's going to help to bring your viewer's eye to the center. Just like that looks good. And if you're too zoomed in, a lot of people, you may your photo may look like this. Go ahead and hit Command minus once or twice to zoom out. That'll give you some more control over this circle and the edges. So that's really important. Let's toggle the before and the after. Before and the after. Before and after. I think that is starting to look pretty good. I might drag it out on these edges just a little bit more. Before and after. Might drag this up just a hair. And I think that's looking pretty good before and after. So now those adjustments are all good. Let's look at what we've done here with all of our masking tools. We will toggle the eyeball before and after. That's what we've done with our local adjustments there. Last step here, we want to reduce the noise. Most of us are probably going to have noisy images because we're shooting fast shutter speeds. You can see 2.5 seconds, ISO 3200 on this shot. So we want to go in and do a little bit of denoising. I would highly recommend Topaz Denoise uh, is normally what I use. I understand a lot of you guys might not already own the software. So if you don't own it, go ahead and do your denoising here in Lightroom, which still works well, not quite as well, but it works decently well. What you'll do is click denoise. It's going to take a second to load here. Then you will adjust the settings. I'm not crazy about this interface, like I said, and how it works, but you can drag this around up to somewhere in the sky like this. And you can click and hold on it without enhance and with enhance. You can see it does quite a bit. I usually like around 50 to 75. Let's go ahead and do 65 for this one and we will go ahead and hit enhance. It's gonna take just a second to load out. Now that it's loaded out, go ahead and hit command plus on a Mac, control plus on a PC to zoom in. And you can see how we have removed quite a bit of noise in the sky compared to the original here. Um, you can see there is a ton of noise. It might even be too much noise reduction, so we could go back in and make some adjustments there and redo it. But otherwise, I think this is looking pretty good. So you can see how we went from our original image here, which was pretty bland and boring, but we did have nice colors. Um, and then we kind of enhanced it here. So that is how I would go about adjusting and editing my Aurora Borealis photos. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I really, really hope it was helpful for you. That is exactly how I would edit my Aurora images. And I hope that you guys will be able to follow along. Of course, if you have any questions, please leave them down below. I'd be happy to answer them for you and happy to help you guys to really dial in your edits and make your photos look fantastic. It was a fantastic event. Um, and I think that everyone should have some really, really solid photos from it. And even if you're watching this video in the future, maybe you shot the Northern Lights somewhere up north um, in the future, I'm sure you still have some great Aurora photos. There's plenty of great storms every year. Thank you so much for watching. If you guys are interested in improving your photography, make sure to subscribe to my channel. I always appreciate it and leave a like and a comment. It helps me to keep this channel going to provide you guys with these free videos every single week to help you improve your photography. Thank you guys so much for watching. We'll see you guys next time.